Uh, the subject matter of his speech would be strategic challenges facing European democracies. Uh, he's going to speak on that issue for a little while, and then we're going to do uh, Q&A, uh, question and answer. Um, David has agreed that it's all on the record. There's no Chatham House rules here today, uh, for those of you, uh, uh, you know, who are interested in that type of thing. But um, sometimes we do Chatham House rules for the Q&A, but uh, David is happy uh, to just have an open session, and it's all on the record. So, David, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, Michael, thank you very much indeed, and thank you to, for the invitation to come and speak here again. I think the, the first time that I spoke here, um, which is probably a decade <coughs> ago now, I mean, I remember that um, I, you know, I was very honoured to, to be introduced to the late Garrett Fitzgerald um, here as uh, sort of part of the, uh, the audience. Um, um, and I always enjoy coming to Dublin, uh, and um, I have yet to fulfil a promise that I gave to the Tornish to some months ago that I would find a time to go to Cork uh, and, and do, do the tourism and contribute to his constituency's economy uh, in a generous fashion. Um, what I thought I'd try to do this afternoon is, while starting with the context of Brexit and the forthcoming negotiations on Phase 2, to try to take a step back and look at the UK-EU 27 relationship in a broader strategic context. Because what troubles me most is that um, on both sides, not both sides of the IRC particularly, both sides of the channel, um, there is a risk that people become so absorbed in the uh, important and difficult detail of a complex negotiation that they fail to keep in mind the geostrategic context in which the UK, Ireland, and the whole European democratic world is now operating. So if I can start with the outlook for the UK and the EU. I mean, the general election produced a decisive result, and certainly... The reaction I've had in my own locality is talking to people on the streets. You know, having experienced this is the first general election uh, that I have experienced as an ordinary voter rather than a candidate since 1983. So this is a very odd, uh, been a very odd experience for me. Um, but there's been a, a, quite a sigh of relief, a sense that okay, a decision has been taken, for good or ill. Now we can get on with things, and a great deal of the appeal of the Prime Minister's slogan of get Brexit done was that there is an intense war weariness in the UK amongst people who are just despair of ever seeing this subject away from the headlines or uh, um, top of the news bulletins when what they're saying is how does this make a difference to my life and to my family I want you to be talking about fixing my local hospital um, or improving the education in my children's school or making it possible for my daughter and her boyfriend to get a house um, or uh, having a social care system that means my 90-year-old mum is looked after or just fixing the potholes in the road. Um, and, by get and I think we will see at the end of January, because I, the, the bill will go through, that the House of Lords is not going to kick up a fuss over something that was central to the manifesto of a newly elected government with a clear electoral mandate. I think what we'll see then is, you know, energy going into phase two, but I think there'll be an effort by the government to try to move the attention of the media uh, onto other aspects of its domestic policy agenda, particularly because I think that is what is going to matter to the voters in the seats that the Conservatives gained from the Labour Party in cities and towns in the north and midlands of England and in Wales last week. I mean no doubt that Boris Johnson wants a deal. It's very clear that you know, he, he wants to get it done by the end of the year. And now, it's true. Um, you, know, you know how the UK parliamentary system operates. A government with a majority in the House of Commons can do most things. You know, it can pass legislation. It can amend legislation subsequently. Um, a huge amount of the content of the Withdrawal Implementation Bill is going to be a series of important but technical amendments to the EU Withdrawal Act um, that um, 
to hit the statute book a few months ago. But, but there's no doubt, I think one shouldn't pretend that the Prime Minister is less than genuine in, in wanting to have this, this done by the end of the year. And so I think the, the outlook is, you know, at worst, you have a, a breakdown and you go to WTO terms, and clearly that is good for neither side. Um, if you don't have that, then you will have a deal. And I think that um, that will depend on the scale of agreement, will depend on each side's willingness to compromise um, about what, in essence, would be ba a regime based on zero tariffs and quotas with some kind of future process that was leading on towards further um, a further timetable to thicken up the relationship, perhaps on things like security, cooperation, that um, might not be uh, agreed instantly, although it's obviously our interest to do that, but because that would make security cooperation would make it a mixed agreement that takes you international ratification as well as EU ratification. Uh, and so it may be, given the short time scale, scale that you have to have an agreement on a core, uh, 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 things that are EU competence only, and then you have a process with, I would argue, for clear um, time-limited objectives and decision points to take that forward to, to, to thicken up the relationships in the future. Um, now, whether, whether or not people on, on both the EU and the UK side think that um, the, the, our current arrangements can or should be extended, I think will be a matter for, for them. I think it's not what's in the Prime Minister's mind at the moment. Um, I think that um, my hope is that we'll see that new partnership evolve and deepen further over time. My fear is that, worst case, we get an acrimonious divorce, um, which will take place just at the time when the geostrategic realities are putting a huge challenge to the European democratic model. And the risk is that, on an issue like fisheries, to take the obvious example, both sides get trapped by the internal logic of their position uh, and uh, you know, they start to dig trenches and then find it politically very difficult to clamber out of them to make compromises. And so I think that is another reason why I believe that um, political leaders need to keep their minds on the, the broader global picture because the challenges I, th I think that are facing the European democratic world are massive. Um, if we start to look at the reasons why so many voters in so many European democracies have been attracted to parties that, and movements that might in the past have been described as extreme, that you know, are termed uh, populist or, or insurgent, um, then one of the prime reasons is that people feel that they have got left behind by uh, uh, economic and technological change that is upsetting long-established assumptions about work and about careers and about incomes and opportunities for the next generation. And while everybody's attention has been focused on Brexit, it would be utterly wrong, in my view, to think that the UK is somehow a case apart. I remember Carl Bildt saying to me more than a year ago, David, you have to tell Mr Farage that he is part of a European phenomenon. Um, and if you look at France, where there's no sign yet of a serious recovery by either the Socialists or the Republican, if you look at opinion polls in Germany, now where the AFD is ahead of the Social Democrats and where the Christian Democrat vote is at much lower levels than uh, in most of recent history. If you look at Sweden, where um, the most recent polling I've seen suggested that the Sweden Democrats were getting more votes than even the Social Democrats. If you look at Italy uh, and Salvini's continued strength there. If you look at Spain, and the fact you'd had an insurgent left-wing 
force in Podemos, succeeded in, in a sense by a, a, a right-wing uh, insurgent force in Vox. I think you start to get a picture that this is a Europe-wide phenomenon. And I'll, I'll leave it to transatlantic specialists to say whether you know, that, that, that what we've seen with President Trump in the United States is a, an American version of this or has different roots. I personally, I think there's a lot in common in terms of the, the motivation of voters who have abandoned the traditional center-left and center-right um, uh, parties. So those economic and technological challenges are grave. If you look at the state of Europe, we are still, as a continent, recovering from the crash of 2008 and 2009. We're trying to do that while, while still working through the competitive pressures that have arisen as a result of trying to bring roughly a third of the human population into an integrated global economic system for the first time. That's been happening you know, really, I suppose, since the 70s, since Deng Xiaoping's reforms in China. But that is having consequences in terms of global competition, uh, with the outsourcing of much of manufacturing to Asia, uh, that you know, the, the final development of which we have yet to see. Even more strikingly, we are seeing digital technology shaking up white-collar and professional work in the way that factory floor working was revolutionised by robots a generation ago. So I now talk to accountancy and law firms in London who say that they can use AI to do much of the work that they have employed junior accountants and lawyers to do. They then go on to say they still think they'll need the senior ones, and they haven't worked out the business model that <laughs> delivers them without having the juniors. Um, I talk to editors who say that there is quite a lot of technical journalism that you can now do with the right algorithms uh, uh, without the need to hire actual human beings as journalists. Uh, and if we start to think through the implications of this, we have all grown up in a world where parents will tell their children if they study hard, get qualifications, apply themselves, they can look forward to a career that is both intellectually and financially rewarding. And if, if AI is disrupting that model, what does that do in terms of uh, the political impact and social impact upon those people. We are also, while all this is going on, trying to achieve across Europe a target of net zero carbon by roughly mid-century. You know, different countries prefer different targets. But you know, whether you're looking at 2050, or even more if you look at 2030, um, this is going to require huge changes in the way that people live their lives. Um, whether you look at you know, looking at transport, perhaps the most obvious example, but also in terms of the design standards that are required of homes and what you do about the stock of older buildings where retrofitting uh, becomes is much more expensive and complicated for them at uh, uh, insisting on higher uh, environmental standards for new build. And if I'm right in saying that economic pressure and insecurity over jobs and prospects of the next generation is one of the prime reasons for the rise of new political movements and parties across Europe, and I'm conscious, speaking to the IIEA, that Ireland is a rare exception to that, that model, um, then Europe has to address not just the, the issue of how we tackle Brexit, but some of the longer-term economic challenges. Now, I do actually think that the approach of the both the outgoing and the incoming commission illustrates that some of those lessons have been absorbed. Um, there is a lot more to do. Um, after quantitative easing, there are now few, if any, monetary policy tools left 
uh, to cope with a further external shock or global economic downturn. And I think that is true of both the ECB and the Bank of England. Productivity growth rates um, in the continent of Europe have continued, if you look at the, the recent decades, to lag behind those of the United States or Japan. In service sectors in particular, which are going to be the growth areas because those global trends are going to shift advance, rather, uh, so excuse me, mass manufacturing, um, if not all specialist manufacturing, to lower cost <coughs> parts of the world. Service is going to be the growth area, but services in Europe does not have a developed single market or a stable acquis. Uh, and um, there are still far too many restrictive practices. Anybody who has looked at the German Meister system or who, as I have, had the frustrations of trying to negotiate with German ministers about services liberalisation, uh, you, you soon find that um, you know, there are some very powerful, long-established vested interests um, that governments have been reluctant to confront. Europe has an inefficient and fragmented capital market. The whole debate on capital markets union uh, stems from an understanding that you've somehow got to find a way of enabling particularly innovative smaller businesses to get access to venture capital, um, which they have found it difficult to do. And I would argue the UK has a better record than uh, the rest of the EU at achieving. Um, and R&D spending in Europe, this is one of those areas where the, the new commission is you know, setting its sights higher, but R&D spending historically in Europe, the continent of Europe, has lagged behind that uh, in North America. Um, I also think that there is a structural problem in terms of the EU approach. It's something that Boris Johnson actually has in mind in his approach to negotiations, which is that too cautious an approach, too conservative an interpretation of the precautionary principle, which is fine as a principle, risks driving some of the most exciting and innovative areas of new technology and new enterprise away from this continent to North America and to China. If you look at GM, you look at life sciences, you look at nanotechnology, you look at big data analytics, it seems to me that those, those risks are real and the pace of technological change and the pace of global economic change is so rapid that we cannot afford just to rest on our laurels. Now, in that terms of that economic debate, what does the UK bring to the table? A G7 economy, um, world-class universities, Europe's global financial services centre, which I think is going to remain as such, even though there will be some relocation of particular functions uh, to uh, within the, uh, the, the EU area, an innovative, very dynamic services sector. There ought to be synergy going into the future between the, the UK economy and the EU 27 economy or economies. Um, there are big challenges. I think the UK historically and still now tends to underestimate the complexity of EU negotiations and the extent to which the EU relies, almost defines itself by process and by law and finds it hard to move from an agreed common position uh, of 27 once it has been achieved. I think that the EU, for its part, underestimates the, the strand of cussedness in the British self-image and attitude. The, I, I, I've, all, I've thought for a very long time that one of the principal causes of misunderstandings has been the fact that both sides, if I put it in terms of sides, do not appreciate the contrasting experiences of the other in the mid-20th century. I can remember sitting and having lunch in Tallinn with the then Estonian foreign minister who said to me, and we were talking about you know, European integration and the UK scepticism, and he said, David, look, we're a country of one and a half million people. We lost a quarter of our population 
between the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact and Stalin crushing the partisans in about 46. We were fought over by the Red Army and the Nazis. We then had to live under Soviet rule for 50 years. If that happens to you, you want to grab every little bit of European integration that's going to try and stop it happening to you again. And I get that. And I get that for most of the continent of Europe, no, there are exceptions, Ireland, Sweden, uh, the mid-20th century was a demonstration of how national identities and solidarities and institutions were not enough. Whereas for the UK, the national um, uh, memory of that same period was about how those self-same national identities, solidarities, institutions are what enabled us to survive and for about a year alone in the face of a monstrous tyranny and the threat of invasion. And, and, and I think each side needs to understand some of those, those very fundamental, almost mythological assumptions that underpin their thinking about the European project. Let me move on from economics. The other in major cause, in my view, of public discontent and disaffection, particularly amongst people who feel that they have lost out from economic change, is about immigration and integration. And if you look again at what has driven support, certainly for the Leave vote in the referendum in 2016 in the UK, but also at Le Pen's support in France, at support for... Uh, builders in the Netherlands, for the Sweden Democrats, for Alternative or for Salvini, a lot of this is about migration and integration. And there's an irony here because we all know that Europe's population as a whole is ageing. Not only does that mean the working age population is shrinking as a proportion of the total, but elderly people will need more in terms of health <laughs> and social care, which are people intensive rather than just capital intensive. And as Central European countries get richer, their people become much less willing to do lower-skilled jobs than in the past. And you talk to Polish ministers, you, you get that message very strong. And it's starting, I saw the Latvian foreign minister two weeks ago, and he's saying that is happening. He's start, they're starting to see some of those talented Latvians coming back because you know, they're not going to do the, the meatpacking jobs anymore. Thank you very much. Um, and, and yet... There are real, worry, real worries in many of those losing out communities about how large-scale migration of people is uh, perceived as a threat to their identity. It's another change on top of the economic and technological change that they are experiencing. And it's particularly noticeable in the UK that London, which has had very large scale immigration, where you know, it, it, it is the most diverse city, I think, probably anywhere in Europe. Um, actually, the, the, the support for UKIP or for the Brexit Party has been at a very low level. Where it has been very strong is in communities, I'm thinking parts of the east of England, where a lot of Central European workers have come to do essential jobs in agriculture, horticulture, and food processing. But in areas which have historically been sort of white Anglo-Saxon, probably white Viking there, um, and, and, and they don't have any of the infrastructure in schools to deal with significant numbers of children with English as a, uh, as a second language, and so parental fears uh, about their own children losing out are more acute. Um, so you have to look at this in terms of, a challenge. it's not just about migration, it's about integration as well. And this challenge is not going to go away. It worries me sometimes. I can remember you know, when I used to go to Foreign Affairs Council, sort of hearing someone say, well, we've got to fix this for this year. You know, so what do we do with Erdogan to stop, to, to get him to turn the tap off in the Aegean? This is going to be with us for two generations, at least, as far as I can see. By the mid-century, half the world's teenagers will live in Africa. Um, there are not going to be enough jobs for all of them. Um, Climate change and conflict and misgovernment are likely to add to the tendency for young people who've got get, get up and go to do just that. And if, if I were living in the Central African Republic, you know, why would I not try 
to get to a European country because I can see on my smartphone or on my village TV that there's a, both a better, more prosperous, more secure <laughs> life if I can get there successfully. Um, so those migratory pressures will be with us. And to address this, I think we're going to need a mix across Europe of different tools, diplomacy, development aid, state building, including working on services like police, um, border enforcement uh, staff, and so on, anti-crime measures, um, trade opportunities for African countries so that people have a better chance of making a living at home. And again, the UK brings a lot to the table in terms of those capacities, particularly its diplomatic network uh, and its aid heft. Um, so there would seem to be a mutual interest in finding a way to continue to cooperate together in a structured form in the future, as well as to learn from each other about what works and what doesn't work in terms of integration, because I think every European country is struggling with the notion of how in a liberal and diverse society do you delineate the boundary between respect for different heritages and traditions and beliefs, and at the same time expecting people who arrive newly to conform to the mores of the society which they have come to join. And I don't think any of us have got it, got it right. I mean, neither the the UK's approach, particularly under the Blair governments, to, to what was desi designated as multiculturalism, nor the, the French insistence on laïcité and, and, and the French identity, I think, has, has solved the problem. You can see that in, in the, the realities uh, of, on the streets. Third, <laughs> crime. Talk to any UK chief constable. He or she will tell you that almost any serious crime these days now has an international dimension. And I'd cite three areas in particular. First, terrorism and extremism. Those extremist and terrorist groups use the internet to disseminate extremist doctrines, to groom recruits, and to organize attacks. Secondly, other types of serious and organized crime. That can be both online crime, fraud, and financial crimes, but also it's the use of the web by paedophiles, by drug and people traffickers, by dealers in counterfeit goods. And then the risk of cyber attack, whether by a hostile state actor or by a criminal enterprise, and sometimes the boundary between the two is blurred. Uh, and critical national infrastructure in all our countries is at risk from inadequate cyber security. And that means you know, things like water supply, electricity supply, health services are at risk from a well-organized cyber attack. I think that in the European context, um, the uh, question of how to cooperate better in fighting crime also takes us to a consideration of the situation apropos the Western Balkans. We know that some hundreds of foreign fighters from the Middle East have returned there, particularly to Albania, Kosovo, North Macedonia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And that those Western Balkan countries are being exploited by uh, organized professional criminal gangs as a relatively safe space for their operations. And the EU's rejection of enlargement seems to me, therefore, to add to the risks or to European security for the future. And therefore, in terms of thinking about that future, not just as regards the UK, but the continent of Europe more generally, we have to think through, if not formal enlargement, then what is the alternative to that, rather than risk those countries drifting back and being a potential safe haven for organised crime on our doorstep. For both the UK and the EU, the immediate risk in the forthcoming negotiations is we end up making all of our citizens less safe, that we cut off access to each other's databases. And I can remember how at the time of the uh, uh, attacks in Paris, that the, the importance of data sharing uh, between Scotland Yard and the UK immigration authorities and their counterparts across 
Europe. And so I, I've always found during Theresa May's negotiations that the frankly dogmatic attitude taken by the European Commission towards uh, UK participation in EU policing and criminal justice measures and institutions was defeating the very object of the existence of those systems, which was to keep citizens safer. I would not like to be a minister in any jurisdiction whose country was the subject of a successful terrorist outrage, who then had to explain why the subsequent investigation had shown that uh, another jurisdiction, perhaps the UK, had had uh, information that would have, could have prevented this, might have prevented it, but that uh, the, the rules forbade the sharing of information in the way that that is possible now. And I, I would hope that in the negotiations, both sides give a high priority to this issue. Fourth challenge is that of Russia. <laughs> we have seen in the last few years <laughs> Russia promoting criminal, including cyber pressures on Europe and seeking to influence the Western Balkans. We're seeing Putin seeking to re-establish Russia as a great power on a global scale and to push back against the advance of the European democratic space that we saw in the years after 1989. We've seen this at its most stark in Ukraine and Georgia, but in the Baltics we have seen the abduction of Baltic nationals uh, to uh, stand a bogus trial inside Russia, and we've seen attempts at intimidation through military exercises close to the border. Sweden and Finland have suffered Russian incursions into their air and sea space. <laughs> the United Kingdom has seen that, but also a flagrant chemical weapons attack in Salisbury that led to the death of a UK national. <coughs> in the Western Balkans, we've seen an attempted coup in Montenegro, uh, a defence by Russia of Republika Srpska, uh, and the cultivation of President Vucic, in particular of his political party in Serbia. And I could go on about Moldova and Belarus, but, but we're not time to, to do that. And it seems to me that Putin has developed and practised hybrid conflict. His wars don't have a neat beginning and an end, and they involve... Um, surrogates, mercenaries, COVID action, information warfare, including exploiting social media, economic pressure, with the, whether it's the gas supply, um, uh, whether it's the Hungarian nuclear program or Nord Stream 2. And this is happening while the United States is openly questioning its 70-year-old role as the guarantor of European security and defender of a rules-based international order. And I think it would be a mistake to say this is just a personal matter for President Trump. President Trump was elected because he represented and appealed to a very important strand of United States opinion that believes that the rest of the world has been having a, 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 an easy ride on US coattails and pocketbooks, <coughs> and that it's about time their own political leaders put America first. And whether or not President Trump is re-elected, I think that one can expect that tendency in US politics still to be vocal. I think you know, it's partly due to the exhaustion of the US public with foreign wars. It's partly this feeling you need to put US interest, America first. Partly the US elite is seeing a strategic need to focus more on China and the Pacific. Partly, I think, it's US self-sufficiency in energy that is actually reduced dramatically at the extent to which it cares about events in some parts of the world. I think we're seeing that loss of interest in the broader Middle East, for example. Um, and in spite of President Trump's very welcome support for NATO expressed at the recent um, London summit, we should not underestimate US impatience with European unwillingness to face up to its need to show both to, 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 to both deploy more resource and more political will in the collective defence of the transatlantic alliance. I think, take one example, I think the US is going to increasingly expect Europe to take the lead, not America, in dealing with any difficulties 
uh, that arise in the continent of Africa. Now, again, I just pose the question that it is, it is surely impossible to think of there being greater European capacity within that Western alliance in terms of defence and security unless the UK is somehow centrally involved. And it seems to be the risk for Europe is you, you end up actually with policy shifting more across Europe in, in the directions that Berlin would prefer, would you, which is rather than the direction Paris would prefer. Final challenge is that posed by China. It's not sort of a sort of threat in the way that Russia poses a direct threat. But under President Xi, China has adopted a much more assertive posture in the world. We're seeing it in the South and East China Seas, in the way in which the Belt and Road Initiative is being used to extend China's economic sway. We're seeing uh, how China is investing in uh, using investment as a strategic weapon, whether that's in Sri Lanka uh, or whether that is in Greece. We are seeing attempts at subversion in Australia in particular, um, and we're seeing diplomatic and economic pressure on Pacific island states to, uh, to, to, to back China in international fora. We're seeing a willingness in China to disregard what they see as unfair and unfair global rules-based system you know, which they would argue is, was imposed on China at a period of national weakness, um, uh, whether they were talking about intellectual property or about conventional trade or about freedom of navigation, you know, those is what we have thought of as established principles of international conduct are subject to challenge. And China makes no secret of wanting to, they would say, rebalance or to shift that international order in a way that takes greater account of their interests and their rising power. And China's going further. It's asserting its model of political organization, complete with the sort of ruthless state control and use of AI and digital technology that we're seeing in Xinjiang, to control, uh, to, as, as equally valid as a model to that offered by the liberal democracies of Europe or North America or Japan. And for you know, some autocratic states, thinking of Africa in particular, but other parts of Asia, this can be quite attractive. We don't have these meddlesome Western leaders lecturing us about human rights. China is showing how you can deliver prosperity um, while, while not um, having to fuss too much about um, uh, political liberalization. We are also seeing from China a very, clear, uh, a very clear strategy to seek to dominate leading technologies of the future. I mean, I think that the people are often missing the point with over the row on Huawei. It's not so much the, the, the worry about a single firm. The worry, I think, is that if we are not very careful, China is going to be in a position such that 5G, let alone 6G, will not be possible anywhere in the world without the involvement of Chinese enterprises in a leading role, because they are pouring money and scientific time and energy into getting ahead of the game. They're doing the same with AI, which again ought to serve as a wake-up call to Europe when Europe risks driving some of these technologies and developments away from its own shores. So what is to be done, to quote Vladimir Ilyich Lenin? Um, the, first of all, my, my principal one is this. There needs to be in Europe more strategic thinking. And we need to be thinking about Europe's place in a rapidly changing world, and then not be absorbed important though they are just with the EU-UK FTA negotiations, with, with how that and our hopes for a future partnership fit into how we see that strategic approach. How is the EU going to challenge unconventional or populist political movements when the driving forces behind those movements, rapid economic and te technological change and large-scale migration are going to accelerate and not diminish. How are we going to defend the European democratic space against both internal and external security threats and maintain rather than retreat from the gains made after 1989. 
I think that you know, we could have a day and a half seminar on, on how we might do this. Um, I think that the starting point for the European continent is probably to take an idea from President Macron, who has spoken about different circles of European cooperation. And that, to me, points towards finding a, a political method and a set of institutional arrangements that allow for greater, the reality of greater diversity within the European democratic space, uh, while at the same time permitting um, uh, active and deep cooperation where that suits our interests. My own view is that for the European Union, for the 27 themselves, there will come a moment of truth because it seems to me that the, uh, the, the members of the single currency must at some stage move towards greater integration of fiscal and economic policy in order to sustain the currency and monetary union. And if they do that, then there has to be political accountability that must imply some kind of institutional political arrangement, whether it's a new chamber of the European Parliament or a self-standing institution of national Eurozone member. I, I don't know. That's, Bruegel is publishing sort of various papers on this. But, but I think that has to happen at some stage, in which case you start to get a divergence between those member states, the full member states, but, but some are in that more integrated currency union and some are not, and some will choose not to be. Some, I suspect, the current Eurozone members will resolutely um, discourage from seeking to, to join. But there remain full member states with the rights that go with that. If you started to look at that model for the development of the 27, where do you then say that the UK or Switzerland or Norway or Iceland dock in to this European cooperative arrangement? Does Circle start to provide you with the conceptual language to start talking about this new framework for the Western Balkans? Because I think if the Western Balkans' history in the 20th century tells anything, it's that for political stability you need to have some kind of supranational framework. Otherwise, those, those countries are largely too small. And at the moment, the, 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 the political and ethnic or ethno-religious divisions are too raw uh, to permit um, rapid uh, political uh, development. Well, they have come a long way since Yugoslavia, but they, they, they still have great difficulties and challenges that they're facing. Um, and you could then have a, you know, another layer of the circles that is uh, dealing with the Eastern Partnership countries. So I think that there is a, a conceptual model there that is helpful to us in trying to frame the way forward. My plea, and I finish on this point, would be that thinkers and policymakers in all European capitals find time amidst the pressures that I, as having been in government for nearly a decade, really do understand about handling the day-to-day, -day, to keep in mind those broader strategic challenges. Because I actually think that the the, the, I still regard, look back to 1989, I regard that as the best thing that's happened in international politics in my lifetime. It would be a tragedy to see that slip away. It was not the end of history, and it was foolish for people ever to think or claim that that was the case. We are under challenge now, but we have an opportunity to build on 1989, to strengthen and equip the European democratic world to surmount those challenges that now face us. The alternative is that we risk slipping back, not to the full horrors of the 20th century, but to a world in which the idea that the whole European continent uh, was a bastion of liberal democracy might seem to be a, you know, have been a passing phase for a quarter of a century, or perhaps a few decades, after the 89 Velvet Revolutions. I don't want that to happen. I think we would all be failing in our duty to the next generations if we allowed that to happen. So I want to see, and I hope to see, 
that strategic thinking across Europe re-energised both during the UK-EU negotiations and in the other work that the Commission and national leaders now do. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, David. That was a, a fantastic um, um, review and tour de horizon of the, the issues involved uh, and the strategic uh, uh, challenges. I'm just wondering, uh, before we open the floor to questions, I mean, um, clearly none of these strategic challenges, or not all of them in any event, can be either addressed, to say nothing of being resolved in the short period between now and the end of the year. So over what type of time scale um, uh, do, do you think it's, it, it will be possible? Because clearly they're pressing. I mean, yeah. they, they, you know, they're, not, they're not issues that can be left unresolved uh, I, I, indefinitely. Uh, so over what sort of a time period do you think uh, we, we, we need to be able to um, um, address and hopefully come to some form of um, understanding about them? It's a very difficult one to, to answer with any certainty. Um, and I think it's almost, it's, almost, it, it's, it's probably um, a false god to um, say we need to have concluded these changes by a particular date, because by definition what's happening in the world is dynamic. Mm. We don't know exactly what's going to happen in China. Um, we, although, though, the, you know, the, I, I, don't, um, I don't read Chinese, but the, so what I, I, I learn about the, the sort of microblogs in China is that younger, educated young people in China are pretty nationalistic. You know, that, that intense patriotic pride is, is real there. And so I can't see the Xi star nationalism falling away. And I think it's not certain, but it's possible that whoever succeeds Putin uh, will be a bit more of the same, but perhaps more nationalist and less harking back to uh, this is the dreams of Soviet uh, era. Um, but it, it, I think the key point to me, Michael, is that we, 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 don't, we don't waste any time in getting on with it. I mean, I would like to see every year's Commission work programme focusing on those strategic challenges and how does that get carried through. I mean, the European Council is the key institution. And the European Council is supposed to set the strategic framework for how the EU operates. And too often, the European Council, I don't, I don't sound unkind, I'm, you know, this is something that's been regarded in the UK context as pretty pro-European, but they, um, it, too often, and we're partly to blame for this, it, 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 it spends its time on the immediate and trying to resolve the technical dossiers that the more junior level ministers have been unable to sort out at sectoral or, or general affairs councils. Um, and <laughs> that is... Um, I think wasting time. So I think I think what's needed is is the European Council to do that. I think that there are a number there, there are a number of number of bricks to build this particular wall. Um, the EU UK negotiation is one. Mm -hmm. uh, the future of the eurozone is another, um, and that will need to have clarity about who leads Germany after Angela Merkel. I think to to really understand whether there's a Franco-German compromise possible that, would, that might then lead to a treaty change and, and, and you know, it's a slightly different order for the euro. Um, we will need, um, I say, a commission work programme. We need a policy on the Western Balkans. At the moment, what you've had is disagreements and vetoes. But there's, there, as far as I can see, there isn't a clear European policy uh, on the Western Balkans as to what the EU wants to happen there. The UK has got to take decisions not just about um, what we want the, uh, the, the, the terms of the separation and scope of future divergence to be, but about where strategically we see our relationship with uh, this democratic community of nations that's going to be on our doorstep. Um, so basically it's political leaders on all sides just need to get a move on on this. And it's horribly difficult. If you're in office, then you know, thinking time is at an absolute premium. Um, but I would hope that think tanks, whether it's the, the IEA or Chatham House or Bruegel, um, you know, will be doing their bit to actually say, this is an agenda we have to take seriously and push forward. 
well, we'll do our best here. But in any event, I'm going to open the floor to questions. So if you would just please, we've got about maybe uh, 10 minutes. Uh, Oops, we'll sorry, take as many too questions long. as we can. Um, <laughs> To introduce yourselves and, uh, and uh, identify any uh, um, organisation that you might be affiliated with. So please, uh, we, we have a microphone here and we'll take them in our order if you just them, OK? Thanks very much. Francis Jacobs, thanks very much for... Very, very stimulating address. Two quick questions. One, one thing which has always puzzled me about the UK debate in recent years has been that the Conservative Party seems to have forgotten about non-tariff barriers, because I can remember I worked in the European Parliament staff when it was Conservatives, whether Thatcher and Cofield or Conservative MEPs who were pushing for non-tariff barriers as being more important than just zero tariffs. Whatever happened to that strand of thinking? And the second one, you've argued very eloquently for structures, longer-term structures between the UK and, and the EU countries. One such structure is party-to-party um, -party links. Mm -hmm. And within the European Party families, I can see the Labour Party, a terrible trouble it is at the moment, but the Labour Party will retain strong links with the European Socialist Party, the Liberals, the Cymru and the SNP will all have strong European family. Where will the Conservatives be in this uh, framework? Thank you, Thank you. I think um, very quickly on those, those two, um, non-tariff barriers, I, I completely agree with you. But I think the, the, the 2016 referendum campaign was fought basically by the Leave side on, on, on two themes. One was take back control, appealing to this sense of being disempowered. And secondly, uh, on the, the immigration question, where the, where the, the British public, unlike publics in no, other European countries, don't really distinguish intellectually between free movement within the EU and immigration from elsewhere. And I stood on doorsteps where people said to me, yes, well, all these Central Europeans coming over, and then you'd suddenly find a segue, so, and the mosques, and the veils. And so it, it, what people were perceiving was two things. First, it was an aspect of loss of control, because they said, well, you can't do anything about it. Even if you think that we should have more control, you can't, because the EU stops you. And secondly, it was this sense of... Deracination, just well, the, the, the community where I live, where I grew up, has been changed. And I talked to pensioners living in suburbs who sometimes come to the door waving a copy of the Daily Mail, um, who, who would um, say, Well, look, you know, I grew up you know, down the road in such and such a street. It's not like that at all. There's a Polish shop and there's a, you know, a halal butcher and so on. And, and so it's that, it, 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 that was what was at the heart of the. Um, the, uh, the, the, referen the Leave campaign in the referendum. Um, uh, but you know, non-tariff barriers, um, I, 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 I think the, the British government will tend to take the view, look, because we have common standards at the moment, there shouldn't be a problem over this. And uh, there is still, I think, a wish on the part of the government to um, uh, somehow hope that um, mutual recognition will suffice. I think that goes back to what I said. I think not enough understanding just how the EU thinks of itself and operates because if you don't have a you know, rules-based system in the 27, well, what's to stop the French or the Italians from going their own way in terms of interpretations? You need an arbiter. It takes you to CJEU. Um, but what I would say is this, with a word of encouragement, nothing I have heard or seen from Boris Johnson <laughs> persuades me that he wants to see any diminution of... Uh, employment rights or environmental or animal welfare standards. He needs the former um, to uh, hold on to those seats that he gained, and he is a genuine environmentalist. Um, and, and so I, I, I think that in practice, and I think this could be one of the, the gaps we have to try to overcome, because I think he, he will see it, as I read him, he will say, look, we're, doing this. we're, not, gonna, we're not going to lower standards. In fact, there's talk about a bill self-standing workers' rights bill being included in the legislative programme this year, and there will be an environment bill included. Um, uh, and so, well, we've got this, we've got legal guarantees, so why do we need to have dynamic alignment? What if you in the EU decide to go off and do something weird and wild um, that just be ruinously expensive for us when we're achieving the same standards by a different route anyway? And it, 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 that conversation will be important. Party to party, look, I... I can honestly say I, I publicly criticised David Cameron when he pulled the Conservative Party out of the um, EPP. I think it was a great mistake. Um, um, I think that uh, party-to-party -party links on the centre-right through the IDU 
will be important in due course. The Conservative Party will need to have some sort of relationship, whether it's formally with the EPP or with with the you know, through things like Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, with the the German part or Hans Heiber Stiftung, and, and through the equivalent think tank with the Moderaten in Sweden. So I think there are ways of trying to do this. Finnegal's always been always been really helpful actually in trying to find creative ways of uh, keeping the Conservative Party in conversations over there. And that sometimes acted as a bit of a bridge between the EPP leadership and the Conservative Party. Please, Honourable Brother Khan, um, I want to raise something with you which you haven't actually mentioned. Um, that is the rule of law. You, you indicated that the response, uh, the, the experience of the British in the mid 20th century was completely different to what uh, Europe ex or most European countries experienced. But the response of the British then was led by Churchill at one level and British lawyers on another was the European Convention on Human Rights. What's going on inside the Conservative Party that this document which promotes the rule of law is being attacked consistently, being talked about as needing revision. And I mean the Convention on Human Rights, not the, yeah. the EU-based Charter of Fundamental Rights. And is this not giving succor to uh, other autocratic uh, type, uh, people with autocratic tendencies, uh, dare I say it, in, in Eastern Europe, but also in Britain, who attack the judiciary. Now, I'm not saying the judiciary can't be commented upon and can't be attacked. But even the Prime Minister uh, took a view that the checks and balances of, of uh, an independent judiciary shouldn't really be applied the way they were on the prorogation issue. So what's going on inside the Conservative Party on this? And secondly, is there any countervailing force anywhere in Britain, uh, in British thinking, on, on, on this drive against the European Convention on Human Rights, and I'm going to say rule of law, allowing for more arbitrary rule. I think, a um, couple of points to that. First, um, it's been a running theme in English and then UK political history since at least the 17th century about what is the right balance between Parliament on the one hand and the courts on the other. And nowadays, of course, that would be Parliament as the expression of a public democratic mandate with universal suffrage. And, and you know, to what extent should the courts be able to come in and limit, in the interest of a plural society and the rule of law, um, a decision that has a democratic mandate given by the people to, to Parliament to act in a particular way? Um, I think that um, the... Ironically, actually, the fact there's a government with a secure overall majority should reduce, ought to reduce friction, because um, in the past, coalition government, Theresa May's government, would sometimes use secondary legislation because they didn't want to take the risk of primary legislation that is amendable, um, and secondary legislation can be struck down by the courts, acts of parliament cannot be. Uh, and, and actually, now you've got a majority, if it push comes to shove, you can amend primary legislation to make the law clear in the way you want it uh, expressed. Um, I think on the convention, um, there, there are two things happening. First of all, um, the court itself, the Court of Human Rights, shifted um, 10 or more years ago um, towards interpreting the convention as a living document. And that's led to a number of um, you know, cases, the prisoner voting being an example, which were not in the minds of the people who framed the convention in the first place. And if you like, it's, it's, it's a bit of a reflection of sort of the US debate between you know, the strict constructionists on the one hand and those who have sort of more creative uh, view of the, uh, the Constitution as a living document. Um, <laughs> And while I, you know, I, as Minister, I solved the, the prisoner voting issue. Um, and um, uh, it did, frankly, didn't bother me that a, a too much that a relatively small number of prisoners got, would get the vote. Um, but to the British public, it seemed an affront, particularly because there were acts of Parliament saying that prisoners should be deprived of the franchise uh, as a consequence of imprisonment. Um, and there were also some real difficulties in a number of high-profile terrorist cases. I'm thinking, for example, of one man, Abu Qatada, who um, 
uh, was um, you know, subject to deportation. You know, he, he, he was not a British citizen. He could be deported. He is known to be extreme and still a danger. Uh, but we were being told by the Court of Human Rights that we couldn't deport him um, to, because there are insufficient safeguards in the country to which we wish to deport him. Now, Theresa May as Home Secretary, after a lot of work, I think got him to Jordan at the end of the day. The Jordanian government gave the required assurances that satisfied the court. But that type of case, which presented the ruling of the court as having a consequence of leaving British people less secure, uh, and you know, with the police and others openly critical and saying this is suck up huge resource, we're trying to monitor this man, we can't do it uh, 100%. That's, that's what leads to it. There are plenty of voices, including the current Lord Chancellor, Rob Buckland, who are very uh, firm in speaking up for the rule of law. So I, I, I think sometimes, you know, don't, just, don't trust a Daily Mail, Daily Express headlines alone in, in interpreting what's going on. Yes. Thank you very much, Chairman. <clears throat> My name is John Connor. I'm a member of the Institute. David, you spoke in passing about maybe the British underestimate uh, the complexity of working out a trade deal with the European Union, which is under, to be under process shortly. Maybe two, and I'm, I hope this isn't off the agenda, they might also be overestimating the complexity of negotiating a deal with the United States, which is very much part of, uh, of, of the debate and indeed of the campaign. Now, given that there might be, keep this in mind, that in a year, because certainly I hope it would happen, that there would be a change of administration in the United States, and we might go back to the Obama line, which would put you at two as, quote, the end of the queue in relation to, to trade negotiations. So maybe we might have your thoughts on that, Sir David, please. I think the, the Americans... Um, Look, if we get a, some trade liberalisation with the United States, I think that is a good thing. I think that doing that in a US election year is going to be very demanding. Um, and, of course, this has to be approved by Congress, not just uh, by the President. Um, you know, once the, the farmers in Iowa um, you know, start to say what they want, it, it's, it's very difficult for American politicians in this year, above all. Um, I think that um, PM has been pretty clear that he, he's not going to accept a dilution of animal welfare standards, and that does raise questions about um, food imports. I mean, I didn't know. We go to America, look, we tuck into chicken over there, we don't check whether it's been chlorinated or, or not. But it's, it's, about, it's not about the food safety, it's about the animal welfare and hygiene rules that, on the farm that lie behind that and lie behind the need to, chlor to chlorinate chicken carcasses. Yeah. So I think that I think from the U UK point of view, of course, some of what we'd really like is the opening up of the US procurement markets, and that tends to lie at state level. Um, and I remember in the um, TTIP, the abortive TTIP negotiations, that that was you know really really tricky. And every time you talk to somebody in Washington, they say, "Oh, terribly difficult. This is all states. You know, we can't do anything about this." Um, innocent as pie. And so yeah, I think I think it would be difficult. Um, I think that um, it might be um, more limited than perhaps initial, initial... And we have pretty open markets anyway. One of the, the problems, I think, the challenge of the UK is that by global sense, we have a very open market anyway for both trade and investment. And actually, what further gains are there from liberalise, liberalisation that we, that we can offer? You know, we can, there are some we'd like to get, you know, we knock down other people's barriers, but we don't have that many of our own that we can offer to dismantle. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. We've just run past our, 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 our time. Just to say thank you to you, David, um, listening to you speak and, and, and hearing the kind of the, the force of your arguments, I think it reminds us, I think, of one of the reasons why we missed the UK uh, in the halls of the European Union. But, of course, you're not going to be too far away anyway. And I think, uh, <laughs> listening to you earlier on, I think... Um, the commitment also to to, um, to shoring up the relationship between uh, Britain and Ireland yes. and providing uh, the mechanisms there to assure that into the future is something obviously to which um, you and, and your colleagues are, are remain uh, committed. So thank you very much indeed. We wish you the very best in, uh, thank you. in your, your new life uh, with the freedom <laughs> that you now enjoy, uh, including the freedom to speak openly without Chatham House rules. Which is wonderful. <laughs> but thank you all uh, indeed. I don't know if we have any more events between now and Christmas, but if we don't, um, and I don't think we do, public ones anyway, I uh, just wish you all a very, very happy Christmas and a happy new year. Thank you. Thank you.